uh, take their seats. We'll get going on the afternoon. Boy, this is a compliant group. It's, it's a, usually, uh, we've had some of these genomic medicine meetings where we've had to essentially fire off rockets to get everybody's attention. So that's, uh, I'm glad we, we have them in, just in case, but. Uh, um, so uh, panel two, uh, which is now, I think, a nice tra uh, transition from uh, the data discussion because a lot of what we talked about uh, related to data was also about knowledge associated with the data. And so we're going to be uh, focusing on that um, in our second session here. And uh, co-moderators uh, for this session are to uh, my left, um, Atul Butte, who did not introduce himself because he was uh, actually, he, he missed Dan Macy's um, uh, uh, advice to the keynote speaker because he was giving a keynote at Georgetown earlier uh, today. So I'm, I'm sure it somehow uh, went okay even without Dan's uh, sage advice. But uh, so we'll let Atul uh, introduce himself and then uh, Josh Peterson and they'll lead this session. So hi, I'm uh, Josh Peterson, and just to give you a little of my background, I've been working in uh, primarily drug clinical decision support for 14, 15 years, um, and more recently in pharmacogenomics, uh, so that's a little bit of my bias. And reflecting on uh, what we've been discussing this morning, I think there's been a lot of agreement about the importance of encoding uh, genomic knowledge and the fact that it needs to be maintained over time. Uh, preferably in some accessible central repository. Um, but I think there are a lot of uh, issues that we've not touched on that make this um, one of the more difficult clinical informatics challenges of our time. Um, so I wanted to uh, bring up a couple of those and then turn it over to a tool uh, to talk some more. Um, so one of my observations in clinical decision support in particular is that um, you know, CDS has a pretty mixed pedigree. Um, there was a lot of work in uh, four to five academic medical centers initially, um, and this has transitioned in some cases, uh, particularly drug uh, knowledge, to um, that's now managed by a number of commercial providers. And this is these, uh, these commercial providers um, have subscriptions and hospitals and practices either buy these individually or as part of an EMR contract. Um, but the evidence that these large knowledge bases uh, change care for the better um, is fairly low. And uh, there's also a great deal of frustration um, at the point of care with some aspects of this knowledge. So reflecting on why that is, I think some of it is the uh, potentially the vehicle for how the knowledge is delivered. Some of it is the workflow um, and how it's integrated. But I also think there's aspects of the knowledge itself that we should talk about. Um, and it's already been brought up earlier that um, very frequently this knowledge is underspecified. Uh, so there may be uh, too few elements uh, that are included in the rules. There may not be sufficient exception handling. Um, and I want uh, part of the discussion to be essentially how genomic clinical decision support might be able to avoid uh, some of this fate. Now there are um, some great examples where a central clinical decision support facility has worked very well, and one of those, um, if you're not familiar with it, is in immunizations, where there's currently a central repository um, actually uh, managed privately that is subscribed to by a number of uh, public health facilities and, and hospitals, and, that, and they provide the rules um, that then um, apply to uh, the immuniz apply to a patient's status in terms of whether they need immunization or not. So that, that's working quite successfully. Um, so that, that's sort of one issue. Um, the second issue uh, that I think we can discuss is de to deconstruct a little bit by what we mean by knowledge. I think we uh, discussed some of this earlier where we, where we focused on how to specify genetic variants. Um, but there are other, a lot of other clinical aspects of a rule that we've not touched on, including how uh, diseases or drugs or other patient characteristics uh, should travel along with, and how much of that should travel with the geno uh, genetic variant. Um, and with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Atul. Great. Well, thanks, thanks for having me here. Um, just as a quick introduction, I'm an associate professor at Stanford. 
Uh, I got, uh, I think I'm in the room because I got involved with one of the first interpretations of a patient presenting with the genome, happened to be a faculty member at Stanford. And to do that, we built one of these private uh, knowledge bases by curating uh, the genetics literature. And with that, I'm a founder of a company called Personnel. So I have a uh, major kind of disclosure there. And I'm an investigator on ClinGen, which is funded by NHGRI, but I'm by no means am I a principal investigator. And so I have a couple of thoughts. I've, I'm the kind of annoying panelist who has missed the entire meeting, but I can kind of guess, you know, what's going on here. And I've chatted with a few people. But so I got maybe six points I wanted to bring up. And if that isn't, if none of these are controversial enough to spur on discussion, I should just get on a plane and go home. All right, so the first one is uh, genomic exceptionalism. So I keep, uh, I caught a little bit of the first panel. And uh, I kept thinking, uh, why do we make such a big deal about clinical decision support for genomics compared to other lab tests? Uh, I'm an endocrinologist. We measure tons of growth hormone levels. I don't think an abnormal growth hormone triggers anything in anyone's system. Uh, we require a doctor to look at that and make a trigger in their head or an abnormal insulin level. Uh, so we're here for genomics because we love NHGRI. We, we do want to think about this as uh, being important to decide on. But it's just important to put this in context, in my view, uh, in terms of how do we manage knowledge in non-genomic fields. Uh, if we had to think about high throughput, high density types of data uh, that's similar, I would have to bring, you know, to my mind comes the field of radiology. And uh, do we have systems today that trigger on raw results from radiology pictures, or do we have perhaps triggers on the interpretations of that data, right? What's coded into, let's say, the interpretations. So just as a simple mental exercise, you might want to look at this agenda and just do a mental search and replace. What would this agenda look like if we just search, replace genomic with radiology, right? What are the data issues that impact radiology CDS? How do we manage knowledge for radiology clinical decision? And actually, probably the answer to some of these questions would be, we would just let the radiologists use their head, for better or for worse. We wouldn't necessarily code any of this stuff, uh, certainly not with the level of rigor that people seem to be talking about at least this morning. So, just the genomic exceptionalism, we're here, and we're deeming importance to this, but just think about other fields that do measure a lot of data that don't have this kind of rigor. The second point I want to say is that the knowledge bases that we're imagining here, and in some contexts, uh, like ClinGen, ClinVar, and others that we're building, they, they are extremely context-specific. I think a lot of this was brought up in the first uh, panel, but w the problem is we're still learning what the relevant context actually is. So obviously there's age-specific, right? You could have the uh, highest prediction of a childhood disease, but if you're 90 years old, you're probably not going to get it at that point. It's subpopulation specific. We don't even have a standardized vocabulary for all the ethnicities in the world, right, besides the federal government five or six or whatever. Uh, it's environment specific. Uh, my good friend uh, Paul Weiss says in a, uh, in a famine, nobody's obese, no matter what your genes say, right? So it's obviously uh, environment specific and sex specific. And, you know, sex again is back uh, in the last few weeks about reporting more. I think the challenge here, though, is that the genetic studies that we've had and been successful with in the past decade have not really had the same kind of clinical relevant rules in terms of how they were published or even run. So for example, uh, it is not infrequent to run into GWASs where the controls aren't even the same age as the cases, because the thinking is, oh, well, DNA is DNA, you're going to get the disease or not, but you would think there's different pre, you know, pretest probabilities of diseases happening. So the genetic science is great from the genetics perspective, but might not be up to par uh, in terms of other clinical science, and we're distilling from this clinical things to do, but we have to watch out for that. Odds ratios versus likelihood ratios, the statistics are going to be different, so it's context specific. Third point I want to bring up is the clinical actionability part. I think maybe the phrase was mentioned, and, we, we, you know, it's a, we don't want to think about all variants, but we want to think about clinically actionable variants, but I'm still stuck with what that means. Uh, we have had super rare N of 1 variants where, because we figured it out, uh, the parents uh, of a child now screen uh, their IVF embryos to make sure the next child doesn't have that. Uh, if that isn't clinically actionable, I don't know what is, uh, because I think even if it's, there's no trigger for that, I think people make actions on some of these things. Of course, they have to be reliable, they have to be reproduced. So the trigger, but the triggers cannot be refer this patient to a geneticist, okay? I'm kind of wondering what is the action part of the actionability that we're going to have to build into these knowledge bases. There are not enough geneticists on the planet to handle all of these, as have been written about many, whether incidental findings or not. So the actions in this future knowledge base have to be actions for a primary care doc or even simpler. Uh, you know, here are the 10 things you're going to have to deal with before they're even seen by geneticists, probably in another state. 
And so the action side is going to have to be a lot more specific. There are certainly more radiologists and that, than there are geneticists. That's a reason for exceptionalism. I want put, uh, number four for me is dynamic applied knowledge. I think that was already brought up this morning. I heard a hint of this, that we're going to have to reinterpret patients. The patient has changed because they get older. The call on the genome might have changed because we have the raw reads and today's bioinformatics call might be different on that variant. And the knowledge base has changed. And all this has to somehow magically happen even without a new encounter and certainly no encounter to bill for. So we have to do this and we're not even clear like when we're supposed to be looking at all these variants. Point number five is this challenge of even the best knowledge bases I think of today don't capture whether we were right or not. Um, for me, a lot of people are making the story about the BRCA1 database, for example, and how it's some, annoying to some people that there's a company that has a lot of these known variants uh, because they've been running the test uh, longer than most people. But at the same time, it also kind of hurts me that they don't actually even know what happened to the patient. They got the variant. They got the genome. What the hell happened? Did, when the surgery was done, did they even see a tumor? None of that folds back. None of this is even planned to fold back into these databases today. So did we even make the right call? A lot of times we're, our outcomes are bioinformatics predictions on what these variants really mean, but we really don't know what exactly happened after that quote unquote clinical action was taken. And we have no workflow to get that back into a knowledge base. And then the sixth and final point I'll make before we're turning it over to the whole uh, crew here is how much of this is going to be done in academia versus industry. The, the challenge I think you're going to have, I guess, in this room is if all of a sudden you make this so useful. All of a sudden, industry is going to run with this by the end of the day, okay? Because I think uh, we're, you know, there's still this struggle. Is this useful? Is this the right time? And there's also this kind of this tightrope. But you can make this so useful, all of a sudden, others are going to run with this outside of academia. And there are going to be questions about open versus closed. Is one approach faster versus slower? And what exactly is going to be academic here? The development of these CDSs or the testing of these, these CDSs? And with that, I'll turn off the microphone. Great. So I think we've uh, teed up some issues. Uh, I'd look to the uh, moderator and say, is there a, a place where you think uh, there would be a logical jumping off point um, based on uh, what we heard in the first session and uh, the points that both of you have, uh, have reflected and we'll, we can use that to get the discussion going? And then I think uh, once we uh, push the rock off the top of the hill, the avalanche will start. Well, I think uh, one of the things we can start with is the, uh, the first question there, what are the necessary elements of knowledge management and representation? So we, we spent some time on genomics, um, but how do we represent other aspects of clinical care um, and how much of that should travel with the genomic result, how much that lives in the CDS system, how much it lives within uh, the genomic result itself? Okay. I'll push you. So what do we do with radiology today? Do results uh, follow patients? Do it, does the action follow patients today? I have a CT scan or I have a nodule. Do I make a big deal about it there? Is that for me? Yeah. <laughs> First, we're the only two talking here so far. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, so uh, clearly it doesn't, and but uh, you know I'm not sure that's a good thing. I, I think we uh, there's a, a clear literature that we're we're missing a lot of diagnoses based on the fact that that information is not portable. So again, we want to avoid the mistakes of, that we've already established in in other data classes uh, by having our results be more portable and more informative. And so, the portability part can be very standards or oriented, but the conceptual part is what needs to travel with the result so that someone can use it and perhaps take action on it. So uh, this just goes back to the first question of um, necessarily elements of knowledge management. And I think one thing that we haven't ever dealt with yet and I think is emerging is the notion that there will be a lot of different sources of information that come from all over the place. And trying to understand the review, the level of review and the provenance of that information and how respected it is, is going to be an issue. I think to date, there's been so little uh, sort of clinical decision support and largely coming from professional societies, really well vetted sources of information that sort of most people can 
see as respectable sources. And there's few enough of them that we can sort of just manage it. But I think with so much knowledge and so many sources now, it will be difficult to just you know, assume that this is just obvious to everyone and that the need to really develop ways for our community to have different levels of how good knowledge is. And we've been struggling with this in ClinVar um, and work to develop this STAR system where we, you know, have prof practice guidelines get four stars and professional, I mean, uh, expert panels get three stars and then things that come from multiple sources get two stars and then, and you know, really try, and we're constantly, we have another iteration of this because it's really challenging and, you know, and some of them are highly reviewed, you know, in terms of what gets four stars, but other things not, are low touch. but but. It's been difficult, and I think in general, and that's just looking at pathogenicity assessment, which it's not getting into actionability and you know all the other layers of clinical decision support that come off of the, after the first question of is the variant pathogenic for something. Um, and so I think trying to figure out how we manage that vetting of, of sources, I think is, a, is something we have to tackle. Just to second that point, it should be how do we manage the data and also how do we manage conflicts or disagreements in the data? Because when we think about the patient down the road, I think everybody thinks the patient will be going between many different systems. So you're going to have different measurements of the same data type that don't agree for a single patient and we need to work out how to deal with that, I think. So, so I think <clears throat> the other aspect of knowledge management that I think we need to kind of focus on or perhaps um, pay some attention to is this whole concept that knowledge is also fit for purpose, right? Because we, we all can take the same data and we can derive knowledge from it and depending on what we want to do, right, we may have different things. So part of, part of knowledge, capturing the knowledge and, and the representation of it um, and tying it to the purpose of what we are trying to do is an important aspect of it. So, so I think that's just another dimension of it. Thanks. Um, at least my belief is that the final state of ideal knowledge management will give a full interpretation. And I just want to bounce the, my assumption off of others as to, Right now, there are pharmacogenomics committees and people and interpreters. Is the final ideal state self-sufficient, I guess, is the question. So just since we only understand a uh, small single-digit fraction of the, of the genome and, and, uh, and perhaps only partially understand even that, um, you know, I, it, at least in my mind, the, the, nice, the notion that it, it is um, an instruction set you carry with you that will have uh, utility as, as uh, rules look at it over time. Um, and so that's one of the reasons you separate the, the data from the interpretation, not only to keep it away from PDFs, but, but because it, it sort of sits there as a data resource to be queried over time uh, by a series of um, uh, inquiries about the nature of your personal molecular variation, it seems to me a sort of impe uh, appealing, enduring separation of how, where what lives where, um, that you carry multiple copies of your genome. It'll include somatic mutation, but maybe as, as you age, you've got multiple uh, WGS copies of your own genome. Um, and uh, it... It just waits to be asked a question, so to speak, as the book of uh, humanity that's your own version of your own story. Uh, and uh, it should persist over time in a, in a way that is queryable and sort of not bound up with either an interpretation or a particular access mechanism. Just to build on that, uh, back to Atul's radiology challenge, genome is the index of all the molecular information of relevance for human health. So if you believe in the central dogma, you know, at least to some degree, of all the molecules in the cell being derived from DNA and proteins and so on, that means that 
uh, we can use the genome as an index for all that molecular information. So we cannot use a radiology image for that purpose. As true as that is, the genome doesn't tell me how much I ate at Cheesecake Factory last night either. So there is this important part of the environment, which radiology does better capture than the genome. Uh, I would argue that there is no such a thing as an index for the environment as there is uh, an index for molecular state of the cell, which is the genome. Can I just riff on one of the points that at least three of the people just made? So there seems to be consensus in this room that we will all agree to one knowledge base. Uh, I'm just looking up how we classify colon cancer, for example. We have a Duke's classification, an Astrocolar classification, TNM classification. Many reasonable universities and academic medical centers have their own knowledge bases keyed around these. Do we all think we're all going to agree to one way to interpret this? just want to bring a few axes for consideration. One is um, the approach we take to knowledge representation probably needs to be standardized where we want to standardize, but the actual content may not, because there may be disagreements between different groups. And you look, you know, I don't think we're ever going to agree on anything clinical knowledge related where everyone says this is definitely truth, at least for, you know, a, a significant portion of things. And I, I just wanted to note that it seems like the second question about architecture probably influences the first question of the knowledge base, because your approach and architecture towards integrating knowledge into systems and how you architect these systems probably will influence how those knowledge uh, artifacts need to be implemented. So um, I guess just to make that a little bit more specific, I currently think there's three main approaches that are mainstream proposals for how we scale clinical decision support and knowledge sharing. The first is the notion that you develop clinical decision support artifacts using a standard approach where you have knowledge in a standard form. This correlates well to, for example, um, what's uh, being worked on in HL7 and ONC, CMS, et cetera, for the notion of standard order sets or standard documentation templates or standard rule definitions. And that's one approach, and the idea there is you define it in a standard approach, you send it off to different institutions, and they interpret it their way. Um, another approach is the notion of services, where you would have just a standard interface to say, this is how I will provide information needed for a decision in a standard way, and this is how the standard outputs will come back. In that case, it actually doesn't really matter how the knowledge is represented. It's just you need to talk in a specific way. And yet a third one is um, something that's been described as smart on fire. This is also uh, really being worked on with the notion of a health services platform that Mayo and Mountain, Cerner, et cetera, are working um, uh, very hard on. And this is the notion that a lot of uh, vendors already support this notion of embedding a web-based application into the system. So Cerner has this, Epic has this. McKesson has this, you know, a variety of systems have this notion of embedding a web application within your native user interface, and this is an approach to say, let's standardize how we integrate those systems. If you think of it in those terms, then it, almost nothing else matters. You just need to work on that API, and the way you build in um, interoperability for genomic medicine is simply how do you build applications into systems. So I think it might be useful to just think a little bit in terms of what is the target integration approach or we're targeting, and then based on that, that will inform what that knowledge needs to look like. So look, it sense, I, I sense a bit of a potential bifurcation in, in the discussion here, you know, from starting with, um, you know, what knowledge is needed and how do we represent it to, I think, what Ken has put forward, which is to say, should we leave that to some degree um, undiscussed, but think more about um, delivery of whatever knowledge representation there is to a decision support engine. Would that be, a, I mean, that's a very crude way of, of I think, saying what you're saying. Um, but maybe not necessarily, I, I guess what I'm saying is, how, do you envision, for example, that the knowledge base will have a standard structure and everyone will agree to that structure and you will be sending these knowledge bases to different institutions? Or do you more think that it's going to be centralized services that will take in input and say, using the standard interface, we'll tell you what we think in terms of the interpretation, in which case it really doesn't matter how you represent the knowledge as long as everyone agrees on the interface? 
Um, you know, I, I think this is a central point, and I guess what I'd argue for is we try not to depart too much from what standard practice and the rest of the sort of technology uh, industries and whatnot. Certainly the target implementation can define the architecture and can define then the knowledge representation elements, if you will, as, as you've described, Ken. I guess uh, one of the points came up earlier, Atul, maybe you weren't here yet, but you know, the, the level of this knowledge being specified in a hierarchical multi-level multi fashion, and that might imply then that there could be, you know, a variety of sources, you know, for, for sequence data, variant data, uh, the inter interpretation or pathophysiologic state, and then clinical significance, et cetera. And it sort of reminds me of the NCBO and using services like that in conjunction with other CDS kinds of activities. But one of the things we, we did in the uh, CDS consortium work, which helped with, I think, healthy decisions a little bit, was think about that KM schema, the knowledge management schema. And what are all the facets that you have to have to actually represent rules, alerts, templates, forms, guidelines, info buttons, and order sets? And it's, it's broad. It's a big thing. And something like that might exist here to try to coordinate then, you know, representation going on in different instances, if you will, and facilitate then a services uh, approach to accessing that knowledge. So re reflecting on that perhaps as being, you know, a lesson learned from seven years of, of hard work in this, um, five, five years of paid work and yeah. then two years of unpaid work, uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, work nonetheless. Um, I mean, if, if, from your perspective, if in this, in this uh, discussion area in knowledge representation, um, does the schema, does that seem to really be the central um, element? And if so, then should that focus what we're talking about, about what, what sort of a schema should be developed related to the different levels of genomic knowledge? I think that would be a very reasonable start. And I would, would ask Ken and the ONC folks, you know, do you think that the current work underway with healthy decisions could be extended for this use case? I would say probably, although I would doubt any knowledge vendor would or academic project would natively store it in that way. They will probably use, you know, uh, ontologies or databases to store it. It would be the, in, uh, the interchange format. Basically, this would be an XML schema that is a common standard way to represent, for example, to say if this and this and this is true, then conclude this and do this. I mean, it's, it's not really rocket science. Probably the biggest thing that would be needed um, and underlying any of these approaches is a common data model for the data you're talking about. So I think it's, it, in, a, in, a, in a way, I mean, to represent knowledge, you first need standard approaches to represent the data you're talking about in the knowledge. And I think if it sounds like if, where that, that is not yet the place, I think that should clearly be the first target. I'd, I'd like to build on that and uh, iterate what Ken just said. Um, I'm actually doing a research project right now that's looking specifically at applying the HED schemas to pharmacogenomics knowledge. And uh, what Ken just said is exactly correct. What, what's really missing, the sore point that's missing in order to apply that standard to this domain is a common data model and common terminologies to support some of the concepts that are represented. By the way, <coughs> that doesn't mean that each EMR has to adopt a common data model. It means that there needs to be a translation step from the native EMR representation of those data to whatever that data model is for inference. That, that's absolutely correct. I'm talking about the, the exchange of the information as opposed to the storage. So at the risk of, of perhaps moving in retrograde, although I don't know that that's necessarily a bad thing, it's, it's interesting that in the data discussion, data model never really came up as part of that. And so I guess um, uh, do we tend to think, again, not saying that these are completely <coughs> separable, but do we tend to think of data model as, uh, as a data issue, or, or is it more in the knowledge representation? Um, Clem? Well, a couple, a couple of things. I was first going to ask him which of the things he thought was right, but you may have sort of focused us on the data. Um, data models, in my experience, have been the worst tar babies on Earth, and no one ever gets out of it once you start grabbing them in collective manner. You can do it in your own institution, but that's maybe too controversial. Uh, but I think the, the issue, I'd like to go back to a tools idea of the radiology and, and, and uh, Ken's idea. And we really have, you know, we've all talked about a couple of different levels of genomic data. And when you get down really do, deep, 
you know, about how they do it and how many repeats they do it. And I don't think we're close to being able to get that standardized. But, but higher up, certainly at the level of what I'd call a, a Jim's level, you know, that we got to just name all these buggers, each of them, and we got to have them a code for them, and we have to have some standard. That probably isn't too hard because they're so regular. I mean, there's so, well, I shouldn't say that. But there's a lot of them are a lot alike, except they have different effects. But a tool's idea is that we don't worry about the bits in the x-ray. And it, there's a lot of similarity, at, certainly at some level. And I really, that was a, a tickly analogy that I think we all had alike. Maybe not all of us, but many of us. And, uh, you know, we, we may need to step up a level to get started quickly. And the simple things like interpretations or what, you know, th that would get to your point. And I think Ken may, as a younger man, he may be worried about me as an older guy who has been working for 20 years in this and you still don't see enough going on. You'd like to see something going on at least in your lifetime, right? So, so, so let's not get. So, if we find levels and find some areas to make some really hay with, you know, and I think it's absolutely true. If we don't have the data, what's the point of the, what's the point of the rule? You know. Yeah, I want to just address one thing. And again, you know, we've I think we've all tried to develop analogies and metaphors for what it is we're doing, comparing it to things that we have familiarity with. I think in you know in in Dan's talk uh, earlier, one of the points that he made in in, in one of the very first slides was that. In fact, in genomes, we do pay attention to an individual pixel. If you have that um, specific base change that causes sickle cell anemia, that's a pretty darn important pixel to pay attention to out of the entire image. And so in some sense, there are some differences, um, uh, perhaps, uh, com when comparing this to how we think about images, not that that is, you know, what we need to focus our time on is whether we believe this or that analogy uh, is robust. Um, but I think we clearly do want to, you know, reside in uh, what are things that um, would fit within Blackford's model of um, closer to the ideal and important, that we could actually put some effort on and move them forward. And so, uh, you know, that's, I guess, the question uh, in the knowledge representation piece now is w w can we identify a couple of things that we, we would uh, characterize as being uh, in there. And I would just also reflect on the slide that as we went through the different desiderata, that these were the ones that we thought might relate more closely to knowledge representation. Alex. Regarding the pixel, uh, radiology image is usually interpreted in the context of the current knowledge, and the pixel may not be relevant and can be forgotten, whereas a pixel in the genome maybe revisit it 10 years from now when we have a, a more knowledge about what it means and actually it may become important. So I guess that speaks to the third element, which is, uh, you know, knowledge management, governance, uh, and particularly whether we want um, that information to be portable because that pixel gathered at one institution may be interpreted at another. And we don't want necessarily genome sequencing or other high throughput experiments to be repeated. Um, uh, the notion of, you know, radiology or pathology starting from the lowest hanging fruit makes sense, the interpretation, because right now, I mean, we're oftentimes, we're at the level where we know that it was a, you know, mammogram or a colonoscopy, but the rest is free text. So before we talk about, like, how we represent the pixels of the slides in the path report or the pixels and the radiology imaging, we would first say, well, what are the interpretations we could potentially standardize? And maybe that's a really useful thing for this community to say, let's just standardize the interpret the easiest things first, before knowing that there's a lot of hard stuff after it. That would argue to some degree um, uh, to, again, you can argue with the, with the specifics of it, but an approach like the ACMG took in saying, you know, we think these are the 56 genes, or Washington, these are the 112 genes, that we think we actually know enough about to be able to go from a variant to an interpretation to something that we could actually, you know, convert into actionability and potentially through CDS, a tool. So the appealing part about thinking about interpretations is, of course, this isn't all theoretical. There are genomes being done every day, right? And there are interpretations being made every day. But other clinical communities have made a lot of progress. So the radiologists, I guess, have something called RADLEX that they code their radiology findings. Of course, the pathologists have had SNOMED for years, and it's grown to be other things. 
And one could argue or decide whether either of those two, perhaps SNOMED, is enough or not enough, right, to cover these interpretations. But it could be the lowest hanging fruit in terms of capturing some knowledge. So just to, to um, uh, pursue that a bit farther, so in, in terms of thinking about what Blackford was saying about schemas, uh, would you be looking then at, at in terms of uh, thinking about, you know, the analogy with uh, SNOMED or something of that nature, would you be thinking about uh, developing uh, schemas around uh, interpretation of genomic elements? Is, is that where you're going, or, or do you have a different idea? I'm not sure exactly what you still mean by schema, though, here, right, in this kind of context here. But if I, again, I'm just drawing from the other clinical analogies here. There, certain radiological findings do cause triggers to happen, certain uh, reanalysis of interpretations, right, the middle of the night x-rays re reviewed again with, you know, better eyes in the morning, that kind of thing. Uh, so there could be simple and complicated things one can do, you know, whether you roll that all into a schema or not, I think uh, you could decide, right? I think it's actually two different concepts that we shouldn't confound. One is an architecture for capturing, you know, whatever it is. And then in the slots or in the rooms of the architecture could be standardized classifications, you know, a, a gene lex or, or clinvar, whatever the right thing is, not my, not my field. But the, the schema is arbitrary, you know, and, and it has to be extensible, of course, as well. But then it is a, a mechanism with which to, you know, define and share. I guess if we were to get really, really concrete on what could be developed, I would think of something like extend the fire profiles. Fire is a very, it's rapidly becoming very mainstream for, represent, for healthcare data standards, primarily because people can understand it. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very understandable mechanism. Um, and, prop, and for example, saying let's create the profiles for representing genetic test results for, at the interpretation level, where we might say there may be um, tie-ins with the SIMI initiative, which is for developing these kind of models. And, you say, you know, these are the LOINC codes you're going to use to represent these genetic findings, and these are the SNOMED codes you're going to use to represent the, the actual interpretations. But I think if we think in terms of interpretations, there's a rich history of how this has been done, and the only thing you need to do is get the subject matter experts together to say, we agree that these are the top priority um, uh, interpretations and top priority genes we want to create some standards on so that when I and my institution want to write this rule, it's a high likelihood the lab would have reported that. So instead of sort of trying to figure out how they might have reported a SNP or whatnot, it's like, oh, it's probably going to be using this line code and for the result I just need to use this SNOMED code, which means you can create a shareable artifact that hopefully won't require that much translation when it's used locally. So as part of ClinGen, we have our knowledge working groups that are actually doing that and doing some um, uh, variant, uh, gene and variant annotation, not so much the variant, but on, certainly on uh, gene annotation uh, related to some of the actionability. And so, Alex, maybe I might uh, go back to you, and if we think about places where we might be able to develop some synergy in terms of extending um, uh, work that's being done in an existing project into something that would be, you know, more generalizable, uh, can you talk a little bit to um, where ClinGen has been thinking about, you know, how to, how to move, this, um, uh, move this forward and doing some of the representation that, that Ken is talking about? Well, ClinGen had the luxury of uh, starting a year ago, and as opposed to some of these projects, we had seven years of experience. Now, what happened in the last seven years is a revolution in the web driven by commercial, you know, dot-coms and so on, and revolutions in the uh, semantic web technologies. Uh, uh, three months ago, we had a new standard on the web uh, called Link Data Standard Emerge, uh, which is, uh, you know, maybe comparable in, in, in impa impact to the you know, HTTP standard and so on, at least in the opinion of Berners-Lee, the, the inventor of the web. He thinks that Link Data will be as important as HTTP standard, which we all use to browse the web. So, you know, a lot of new developments, and we tried in ClinGen to actually look at where the state of the art of technologies as of, you know, a year or two ago, and ask how can we uh, 
uh, recruit these technologies to address these key problems. And uh, we are still experimenting with it. Uh, that's the short answer. <laughs> the long answer, we are still very hopeful that uh, because we can use these latest linked data technologies, we can use the semantic web technologies to do the data modeling uh, in a new way, uh, which still translates and it's, uh, you know, integratable with these older legacy systems, uh, we will be able to provide the flexibility uh, and a distributed framework. And this is the key, actually, where multiple parties can work semi-independently and as long as they agree on the basic approach and basic technologies, they're still interoperable, both at the programmatic level through APIs using uh, link data platform 1.0, as well as on the semantic level using RDF, RDFS, you know, these technologies that are uh, ontologies used, for example, uh, uh, to represent ontologies and so on. And using these two levels of interoperability of, you know, knowledge representation using semantic web technologies and programmatic interoperability using APIs, I think opportunities are really enormous in terms of sharing knowledge and uh, having a distributed loosely, and the key is loosely coordinated efforts, right? Where the community can uh, agree on a basic outline and still work synergistically. And the Clinton is for us uh, a practical test of these, you know, these technologies. And it's still, still early, it will take a while for us to to uh, report on the results, but we are very hopeful. I just had one point. There was a couple of mentions there of um, defining your algorithm, using the knowledge that you have to build your rules or your guidelines. And then in addition, having some sort of limitation on the genes or the genomic loci that you would apply them to. I think that's an error. I think you build your algorithm and then you can apply that algorithm to any gene, and only those genes for which there is sufficient knowledge would um, make it into the you know, actionable category. I think setting up a specific set of genes which was suggested is, is a bad idea. Okay. Well, on the one hand, I agree with Liz, you know, that you want a consistent approach to the process, and then you can enable various groups to define their lists or whatever. At the same time, I think there is utility, and as much as the ACMG guideline had some criticism, the number of people that have been so delighted to have a list has been pretty Im impressive, and the number of people that have just simply taken that list and done all sorts of things with it. So I do think that there's this balance between developing a, a robust approach and standard that we can apply lots of things to, but then still defining some you know, interpretation and approaches and, and knowledge that we can all agree on. And, and this notion of can we agree on an interpretation is, fa you know, resides in a number of issues that we have to agree on. One is the standards for interpretation. So um, do we, what terms do we use? Do we call them pathogenic or deleterious or actionable or, you know, and we've been working to come up with standards for just how you label Mendelian disease pathogenicity, but we also need them for somatic variants, for pharmacogenetic variants, for complex traits. And there's, you can't fire decision support rules if everybody's calling things differently. Uh, and then the evidence to put them into those categories, of course, is another level of, of complete disarray of, of standards that also been trying to build. Um, and then this idea of well, which things actually meet those categories, um, and those are the list approaches, which genes and which variants in those genes, et cetera. But you can't ever get to that point if you don't have the standards for how, how you name things and how you interpret them. So, well, I'd, I'd like to kind of com combine all three. Um, I don't think what Ken was saying would preclude what you were saying. And I think the items you described are what we got to do first, just so that this could work. In, in, in some sense, at least certainly in the standard, the, the basic Mendelian mutations, they're fairly, a lot alike. I mean, representationally, they're a lot alike. It's just that it has different effects. And it shouldn't be hard to create that first level, but maybe be a little more ambitious and not just say, uh, this is the interpretation. I think we're close enough with Jim's, Jim's help to identifying that variant of the real important ones, you know, not the ones that are scattered over 45 genes or something, but 
So, so, but I think that's, and you three ought to just get together. <laughs> so. so just coming back to what Heidi just mentioned about the need for standard terminologies and interpretations for these things, I absolutely agree. Um, one of the things that I've found, though, uh, and I'm sure others have noticed this as well, is that even if there are standardized phenotypic terms in how we um, talk about these things and exchange the knowledge at the level of a national resource like a, a ClinGen, ClinVer project, um, there still needs to be some sort of freedom at the local level for how that knowledge would be interpreted and applied in a clinic. And so we can talk about standardizing uh, how we exchange this information back and forth, but there still needs to be a way for people to localize that once it gets into their own site. As we're using the term interpretation here, it, again, it seems to me that we're maybe developing some different levels. There's a variant interpretation, which is, you know, is it deleterious or is it benign, or if in pharmacogenomics it's an ultra rapid, you know, and that there may be different of those types of variant interpretations that would need to be developed for different types of uh, contexts. But then I think there's the, the, the clinical interpretation which overlays um, uh, the variant interpretation, which is that even if we all agree that this is a deleterious, then what clinical knowledge do we want to attach to that uh, and that would, you know, um, enable a, a decision support rule? So I think it in my view, at least, it seems important to separate those two to some degree and to um, realize that there's a number of people in, in, the, in the variant interpretation space, the college, uh, um, both CAP and ACMG, um, you know, the CPIC group and others that are trying to get their hands around, you know, can we all agree to what we're going to call these sorts of things. But there seems to be much less um, uh, concerted effort to deal with the clinical interpretation uh, type of issues. And, and so that's not to say that we should necessarily as a group stay out of the variant piece um, because it is essential, but, you know, is that, are there gaps that we could address in the clinical interpretation piece that would be um, more, uh, that, that, that are not being attended to at the present time? So I had Liz next and then Brian. I was um, just a general informatics point. If, if you have rules with which you can exclude particular genes that shouldn't be being considered, I would say build the rules into your system. Don't build the list of exclusions based on those rules into your system. It's just a follow-up. Yes, I want to agree with Heidi that, that, that uh, creating rule, discrete types of rules for what interpretations of variant interpretations is really key, but there's, there's somewhat of a chicken and the egg um, um, conundrum that laboratories have little incentive to report their variants in discrete ways that can be translated to these, you know, using ClinGen to these rules, and if those rules don't exist, and if there's no way to use those rules downstream, otherwise laboratories are just doing extra efforts to create a, a, a discrete field that's going nowhere. Um, and um, I think we have to move forward on, I think we are moving forward and uh, discussing moving forward, we have to move forward on multiple fronts to create the standards um, for potentially an ideal state. Um, to, to, to the, if we create um, structures that fire off of LOINC codes, for example, they'll be woefully inadequate to, to handle the, the level of genomic data that, that, that will be generated. Um, and, and then so th those reiterate, I think, what Heidi's saying, those standards are important. And I think that the clinical interpretations will always be local. I have never yet seen a clinical decision support that does not um, allow a clinician to take that, whatever the alert is or whatever the, the information is being provided by the clinical decision support um, um, alert, to take that information in the clinical context of where it is. So I, I think that it will be impossible to um, force a clinician to, um, to not to be able to create their own clinical interpretation with whatever the variant interpretation is. I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to really try and expand uh, Rob's comments about the variation. 
of local interpretation of those uh, clinical uh, uh, um, decision. I think one thing about the beauty of the uh, allow people has a little bit more uh, 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 flexibility to interpret results actually is, is really encourage them to do research on that. I think this is one of the things I think people can use this CDS system to do additional research given the flexibility you have to interpret the results. I just want to follow up on that. You know, I think we should make a, a dis, or distinguish a baseline interpretation of a variant. For example, when I call a variant pathogenic, to me that says it's capable of causing disease. Doesn't mean it has in a patient or will in a patient, but is it capable? Um, and to me, and although the patient in front of you is a piece of evidence that informs your collective assessment of a variant and what it's capable of doing, and, and therefore as a community, I think we want to strive to have single standardized interpretations of variants in terms of what they can do, but that it is entirely separate, and speaking to your point, Brian, and others, what a physician decides to do with that standard knowledge and whether they think it causes a phenotype in their patient that's shown up in clinic or whether it ever will or, or whether they feel the need to act on it or not, which if it's a terminal end-stage cancer patient with a cardiomyopathy variant versus a 13-year-old with a cardiomyopathy, entirely different decision-making going on. So I think we want to separate you know, a stage of knowledge and interpretation that we do have to agree on and get to in a standard way from the practice of medicine, which is making decisions off that knowledge. Um, I, I think in some of the discussion about how specific, I'm not, I agree, I'm not disagreeing at all with what you said, but how specific um, this interpretation hierarchy goes, I think forgets that the purposes of the rules uh, is that one can tailor the rules to make it be smarter and I think most rules, because I did a lot of rules in my life, you know, you hope to maybe get 50% specificity and the rest gotta be the doc. I mean, you can't assume these are robot doctors because it's so complicated. But I think we're forgetting that in all this stuff, you can tailor it by all kinds of stuff with the rule that, of the kind you're talking about. <clears throat> you need some grist to start with. You need something you can hang on to like the things you talked about. So I'm, uh, Josh. So I think, I th you know, we've talked about a couple different avenues and directions from this, and I think it's um, important to think about this problem maybe in terms of um, what we need to do to be able to um, standardize the maybe interpretation and, and, and language around that interpretation of the raw level genetic data to what actually is transported at a higher level that could be shared amongst, stored within an EHR could be acted upon by different, you know, agents and potentially shared across EHRs to other EHRs. And then the level at which the CDS itself would um, potentially be standardized in terms of what it did and that logic be shareable. So, so I think there's at least, you know, three to four different layers there of standardization and we might want to think about um, breaking those things apart. Um, certainly in terms of representing an, an obvious thing that's been said a couple times, I think probably bears repeating is, is getting past a PDF storage device um, and uh, having uh, structured data with some sort of standard which could leverage LOINC but could also incorporate, you know, would incorporate, you know, RSIDs and, and other sorts of standardized nomenclatures you know, probably re re redundant even potentially to things like star nomenclatures, even though we know there are issues with that. But we don't have to exclude um, existing standards. We can replicate and include multiple layers of standards on top of it. Okay. Um, so we're uh, about halfway uh, through the discussion here. Um, I must admit, um, and, and this is an unusual admission for me, I'm um, uh, not necessarily identifying a clear uh, path forward at this point, and that may be because there isn't one, but uh, I would look to um, uh, my, uh, the session moderators and to others to kind of say, are there things that we've heard to this point in the discussion uh, that rise to the level of, here are some things that we might potentially focus on and, and move this particular uh, piece forward. 
Uh, well, I can summarize what I've heard so far. So uh, among a number of things, we've heard that uh, we need to potentially uh, enhance existing standards for querying um, and representing genomic knowledge, particularly ones that are starting to be adopted uh, more broadly. Um, there's also a, a significant gaps in the way that clinical interpretations uh, could be coded, although this may need a lot of flexibility um, to account for local concerns and local variability, which likely will be needed. And then uh, we need several layers of standardization, so we have the variant interpretation, uh, then we have uh, not only clinical interpretations, but also a certain level of actionability. Um, and, I, you know, one of the things we've not touched on necessarily are, is the qu third question, which is the governance issues arising in knowledge management, because I think that is a, sometimes a sticky issue in this area. So um, one, one of the concerns may be who's going to make uh, not only the standards decisions, but the, uh, the decisions about where the data lives and how it crosses between organizational boundaries. I think, a, uh, I think I can see a lot of potential for aligning around architecture, probably aligning around terminology. I think the, um, as I mentioned earlier, getting, gaining consensus on how to interpret variants is a much bigger prospect. But what feels like it could be within reach is a description of best practices for the P&T committees who are grappling with this. If, if there's a checklist process, I, I really like the, the star evidence rankings that, uh, that Heidi described. So if there's a, you know, if, if we think about it, developing some documentation that these P&T committees can use so that there's harmonization even in the process of evaluating what to incorporate locally, even if the, the content varies, I think that would still be a, a step forward. If I could kind of build on that. Uh, Something that strikes me with the governance is uh, with the folks implementing pharmacogenomics CDS, I think people have gone into it, this is a new area, we need to think about the governance right up front, and it's become sort of standard to have some connection to the P&T committee, like Mark is saying. I think for other types of CDS, it's been, oh, the vendor provides it for us, they must be right, and then you get, get it and figure it out, oh, we, we need to put some governance back to this. So I, I think this is actually, uh, uh, a positive point where we, we have some best practices starting to come together for genomic CDS uh, with pharmacogenomics, maybe uh, more so than others. I was going to make a, a very similar point, which is that for different types of genetic tests, the interpretation occurs in different places, and that may affect how we think about this, for example, what is being transmitted across organizations. So. A number of us are involved in an Institute of Medicine Action Collaborative looking at different use cases surrounding establishing clinical decision support. And one of the things that we found is whereas in rare variant, in, te in tests where you're assessing rare variants for germline disease, labs will often interpret those, those findings and then, you know, there's the potential for the provider to just look at leveraging that interpretation, whereas with a pharmacogenomic test, it seems that very often those come as just variants, uninterpreted, and therefore, in order to target them with clinical decision support, you have to apply an interpretation. You know, from, uh, from the simple primary care practitioner's point of view, I would hope that as we think about this knowledge representation and the, and the KM dimension of it, um, you know, how do we arrive at the scales that will actually help uh, drive the actions in the appropriate way? You know, we have clinical scales for lots of different things and, and uh, in, in healthcare and physical exam and assessment and whatnot, but where, where I think it can be befuddling sometime for the uh, uninitiated is how do you take the interpretation and then determine what's the appropriate action? Could we have something as simple as, you know, you know, one through four, one through three, one through five, and, and have a common gradation, if you will, across interpretation. Given the variation in penetration and expression, this is where I realize it's challenging, but again, implementation point of view, you've got to make it as simple as possible. I, I guess what I heard was uh, there are areas where the expert community agrees on the content, 
that aren't expressed in standards, so that seems like a really low hanging fruit. If people agree, just make it codified that you agree and make it. That's the lowest hanging fruit. The next part might be starting to look at where there are existing standards for representing, say, knowledge. And if you agree on the content, then start seeing if you can put things into those standard formats and see if it works. Because essentially, there are efforts to develop these standards. And like you were talking about, using the HED healthy decision schema and that kind of work. And then probably after that is identify the areas where there is actual semantic disagreement uh, in the community of, for example, what to call deleterious or whatnot, and to work on those. But it seems like if you make a guiding principle, start with the easiest things and then move down, that, that probably would be a reasonable thing to do. Uh, your question, previous question, Mark, seemed to relate to specifics. Um, and I'm focused on what standards exist or are needed. Um, I think I understood that, that there's a lot of work in variant knowledge databases, but you're rather focused on interpretation and presumably the CDS knowledge database. If so, um, I heard just in a discussion the other day, Arden may have some shortcomings. There may be other standards that specifically are less than ideal, or maybe there is an ideal one out there, and I'd be interested in what that might be. Um, or from the CDS architecture standpoint, which is one of your questions, is it a service-oriented architecture? So um, it's only a plea for specific. Maybe uh, we've all agreed, I guess, that we need one of these, but I'm still uh, not clear which audience are we talking about here. So are we talking about a CDS to replace a geneticist? Are we talking about a CDS to augment a geneticist? Or perhaps we're talking about a CDS to assist someone ordering a genetics test? Yeah, or something else here. Yeah, I don't think those are those are uh, ors necessarily. I think again, from a from a context perspective, uh, um, and and certainly I think in some of the groups that are more mature in the in the pharmacogenetic realm, uh, we don't see the role of geneticists or genetic counselors in there. In fact, we event, in, in, envision a time when we won't see physicians in there. That that'll be the realm of the PharmD. Uh, to manage that much as they manage uh, kinetics uh, with some of the medications that we currently utilize and uh, um, and, and so that that's you know that would be a different audience for that type of, of a thing others in right. other cases there might be an augmentation or I think I only mention this because it could really impact whether this is actually low-hanging fruit or not uh, we don't hope to test every night call emergency medicine doc every subtlety of interpreting every chest x-ray. We teach them to interpret the most important things immediately. And for some things, you could say that's low-hanging fruit. But to teach everyone the subtlety of everything is much higher hanging fruit. So I too will miss the comment that there's multiple use cases. This is right. Sorry, that we, there's multiple use cases, and not every use case is the same and that we need to acknowledge that pharmacogenetics is different than germline, is different than somatic, is different than prenatal testing, and that everything we say here won't necessarily apply to all of these equally at the same time. So I wanted, I wanted to get back to a point that both Liz and Atul raised regarding, and I think others have, the fact that there may be differences of opinion about knowledge and that we may get to a point where we really can't develop a single opinion about everything. And so how do we think about an environment where you can show the differences? Um, and you know, one of the decisions we made with ClinVar was, in the beginning, everybody wanted a clinical grade variant database, which only contained the things we understood. And then you know, I said, well, most of it we don't understand, so that does me no good. So you know, we, we ended up stepping back from that and saying, well, let's just be transparent. Everybody can say whatever they want, but everybody can see what everybody says, right? Um, and, and that's the way it is today. You can go into variants, and you can see lots of conflicting interpretations. And while that's sometimes eye-opening to people that we actually disagree on stuff, at the end of the day, it's transparent about the fact that we don't agree on stuff, and that's okay. Um, you know, but this review status that we're trying to implement, the lowest level of review is actually just provide your method for how you arrived at your conclusion and attest that you did a comprehensive review. We're not 
individually reviewing all those variants and those assertions, but we're trying to establish transparency and provenance of, you know, and, and sort of getting at this governance issue a little bit. So I think, you know, if we were both to create an environment that allows a clinician to have access to all sources of knowledge, be they different as they may, that we will get beyond you know, where we are today, where I go to a physician, get one answer, and I have no idea if that represents the entire standard of the community, or that's one of 2,000 opinions that if I went to 2,000 other physicians, I would hear a different thing. And I think that would be incredibly useful, but I feel like sometimes, or a lot of the time in the EHR, we hold this standard, and Dan spoke to this well in the o opening keynote, that you know, if we try, won't, don't, if we wait to implement until we all agree on everything and it's the perfect scenario, we will never implement almost anything. I, I think um, part of the challenge is in, in this space, there's a notion of trying to standardize the knowledge itself, like how you call a variant or something like that. And as an analogy, like if we we're creating standards for quality measurement or distance sport, we're not creating the standard that this is how you treat patients with diabetes. That's not really the informatics aspect of things. It's how do you express um, something. So if you take an example, uh, there's quality measures in sport that hinges on identifying uh, people who are sexually active, females who are sexually active. And it's not that we're creating a standard to say a female shall be considered sexually active if they're taking oral contraceptives or have diagnoses of this. That, that would be beside the point. What we're trying to do is say, how do you express the condition that you know, somebody is taking oral contraceptives or has had a, uh, a pregnancy test without an imaging study after it or Accutane prescription, that kind of thing. So perhaps I, separating the notion of how do you represent knowledge and the standardizing the knowledge itself is, is something we can do. This is an old problem, uh, this question of <clears throat> perfection and knowledge versus trying to get consensus. And I, I've heard many proposals to address this over time. I, I personally think that having consensus gradation of levels of confidence is uh, a way forward. Um, I think we can all agree on a large number of variants that nobody has a clue what they really mean. Fine, they're put into a category called nobody has a clue. Uh, <clears throat> there are other variants, that's a, that's a technical term. Uh, there are other variants, I mean, we can talk about uh, Leshnayan syndrome or other Mendelian diseases where, you know, we're pretty clear what, what's going on. Um, okay. They can go into high confidence variants. You don't need to think about this very long before you could entertain a number of intermediary confidence levels. You know, whether it's a five point scale, a 99 point scale, I don't presume to know. Uh, but it's, it, I think over time, we can frankly register the levels of confidence and belief or acceptance <clears throat> of particular associations. And as data becomes more clear, uh, a, a bit of knowledge can be promoted or demoted accordingly. Uh, I, I think to say that, well, we'll never reach perfection, we'll never reach agreement is a bit nihilistic because that means we'll never have any mechanism or shared library. If we consider, this goes back to Dan's talk as well. I mean, what's the state of the art this week? Basically every healthcare system, including mine, uh, Mayo Clinic, uh, makes its own darn decisions about what it believes and what it doesn't believe. Well, that's a fairly uh, demanding exercise. If we scale that across every community hospital on the planet, and they, oh, of course, they don't write it down, yes. Um, well, some, some write it down. Uh, and as a consequence, we're basically leaving it as an exercise to the reader and, and to completely forego any effort to have some formalization, even though it's improbable, everything will end up in the, I believe this is absolutely true in every circumstance category. That's another technical term. Uh, I, I do think that we can assign levels of confidence prudently and, and usefully. Uh, can I just add something here? Yes. Jamie, um, you know, that's a really interesting point, and one of the things that we can look at is how we can test that. Um, when, I'm, when you brought that up, what I'm thinking about is, um, I don't know if you're gonna have a follow-up to this meeting, 
Um, but if you do, it would be great to uh, invite AHRQ, who now has gotten 16, um, a, a lot of money, <laughs> um, in order to uh, in order to look at how to disseminate knowledge. It's under the context of patient-centered outcome research, but when you're talking about data infrastructure, it can be applied generally. Robert. Uh, just a layer of complexity over what Chris just mentioned about this and, and what Heidi was talking about as far as a confidence system goes. Um, hearkening back to our initial discussion this morning about the context sensitivity of some of the interpretations, these con uh, confidence measurements uh, would then necessarily have to also be context dependent. So a strength of an association or the, the believability, if you will, of an association between a given variant and a particular drug interaction might be very high, but with another drug or another phenotype, it might be mediocre at best, and it would, we'd need a way of being able to call that out. Um, uh, yeah. from NHGRI, and that's <clears throat> to that point, um, for, for ClinGen, not only are we looking at clinical validity with the, the gene curation, but there's also the actionability working group um, led by Jim Evans and Katrina Goddard, and <clears throat> they're being very careful to, when they're making, um, collecting evidence on actionability to look specifically at a particular gene phenotype pair because of that very reason. And then the other thing is that the thought is when we're assigning sort of, they're developing this semi-quantitative metric of actionability, um, and they're collecting all the, uh, the evidence that falls into each of those categories. So they will come up with an overall score, but they're making all of that evidence available. So every institution can look at it, they have access to that underlying evidence, can then set their own threshold for making decisions that are more context-specific. Yeah, I think one of the other things to note there, and, and what I'm beginning to here, I think, uh, emerging perhaps as a, as a nascent crystal from this discussion, uh, is a standardized approach to, to that, that, you know, it's, it's standardized, it's reproducible, it's something that other people could use. And so uh, what I'm beginning to, you know, detect in this discussion is that, you know, perhaps the most fruitful area here is um, to think about um, how to, how to represent um, accumulating knowledge in a standardized way along with things like the provenance, um, the, um, uh, the reliability, if you will, um, uh, and how do we represent those sources so that if somebody is reaching out and saying, well, I want to do decision support around this, uh, and if I point to a knowledge base uh, A or B or C, even though the answers may be somewhat different, it's transparent about how the answer was derived. And so I don't know if that's something that we can use as a point of departure in terms of thinking about what a, whether it be a, a research or, or a, um, uh, an assessment of the current state would be in terms of, uh, of this. But it, it seems like there's a fair amount of agreement around the table that this may be the most fruitful area in this particular domain? Well, I, I see us uh, circling, or hear us circling a lot. And um, yes, that's a good thing to do, but we're doing it already. Jim's doing it, you guys are doing it, and there's activities there. This is a meeting to deal with decision support, and we haven't clarified, I guess, yet where in the decision space this is for. And I don't think it's to help the super expert I mean, I, I, I think it's to help the clinician, but that's because maybe I'm biased, I'm, I'm a clinician. And then the issue about do we have to standardize the decision rule, I don't think we do yet. We don't know enough. But we can't do anything if we don't get some pieces, some grist that it can decide on to even start. And so that's back to sort of the finding some subset of starting to really do things with it. And then institutions will vary it. They don't have the same resources. They can't, you know, they can't refer them across the country, and they don't they have this kind of a capability, that kind of a capability, so they'll be different. And they'll have different kind of data from different labs, and, and they may have to be different. But I, I, think, I think we've slipped away from trying to find a way to get started with decision support, but I, maybe I, I'm wrong. 
Yeah, I just wanted to uh, insert one little bit of nuance. I understand where you were coming from with respect to we have to take the context into account, but I've also heard the uh, that arguments made slightly differently in that we don't want to confuse the clinical question that's being asked with the assertion of the confidence of the association of the variant with the phenotype so that you don't say this variant has low confidence in when you ask this clinical question and high, you know, if, let's say for, if the patient has cardiomyopathy, is it reasonable to report that as causing the cardiomyopathy in that patient versus predicting cardiomyopathy in someone who doesn't have it versus using it as a prenatal diagnostic. Those are three different clinical questions. The, the confidence of the assertion of causality doesn't change but it's the utility of that association to answer the clinical question that changes. Does that right, make sense? Right. I, I, was, I was intending to mean not changing the confidence of the question, but change the confidence of the, uh, of the association itself, of the phenotype. Uh, and pharmacogenomics has this. When we do CPIC guidelines on cytochrome P450s, of course, which are notorious for metabolizing just about everything under the sun, um, you know, there, there could be a variation in, in a given SNP enzyme that has a significant effect with one substrate but not another. I understand, but I'm saying that people have said that you should, in fact, change the, the confidence assessment for some variants because you're asking different questions. And I, I agree with you that drug A versus drug B versus drug C in this SIP variant, you do change the answer. But when you the association of a variant with a phenotype doesn't change because that's based on all of the underlying available current evidence, and you don't change your assessment of that depending on which clinical question you're asking. That's my point. So, thank you. I'll, I'll take a stab in another direction. Um, so, um, it seems like one of the things we've not necessarily touched on as quite as much is, are the rules uh, that um, we might use to reason on the genomic result um, and a little bit about how much of um, the information we might need from the EHR to, to actually uh, act on or actually um, act, on, act on the information and generate a, a, a recommendation. And so one of the things is, are, are we really too early in the course of generating standards and representing variants to, to really get to that point, or do we think that um, there are subsets of genomic knowledge where we can um, get all, of, all the way to creating a central repository of that kind of knowledge? So I think I, I would interpret that as, you know, being um, um, uh, cognizant of the point that Clem is making to say, you know, can we find some things that we can actually do something about? And, you know, if one takes the temperature of the room based on what people are actually doing, I think that, you know, the area where there is at least some amount of agreement in the implementation space is around, you know, the pharmacogenetics. In some ways, that's not surprising because it probably is the simplest example, and we, you know, have a fair amount more knowledge in a lot of cases, and in fact, in one in one case, uh, we do, um, you know, to not to dispute Brian, but to at least uh, put one level of agreement. You know, the FDA says you have to test for 5701 before you prescribe a back of ear. So there's at least a, 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 a regulatory agency that says you must do this. So, in as much as we can all agree on the fact that if the FDA says it, it must be so. Uh, then that would be one that you could actually then say, okay, well, then let's use that as the use case and perhaps take the subset of pharmacogenomics to define a set of use cases that could then be, you know, tested along the uh, spectrum of knowledge representation that we've been um, discussing uh, and then take it one step further, which is to then say, okay, and can we, in fact, represent that as something that people that didn't actually participate in creating the rule could point to and actually utilize in their own system, uh, even though they didn't have to construct it locally, and just take it from really from one end to the other to some degree. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to be, be talking too much. I was hoping there was someone behind me you were pointing to. 
Uh, but there's, so there's two things. So the, if you look at lab, genetic lab tests, they ask for a bunch of stuff by test that differs, which correspond to things you might find in the medical record. So I think you, clearly you got to have some of that stuff, and you can even find some examples. Secondly, at Harvard, and you, got, you might have been involved in it, there was a neat paper that described the distribution of genetic tests two years ago, I think, in general medicine. And there weren't any genome-wide studies. And there, these were more focused. There was cystic fibrosis, trisomy, um, Huntington, some of those kind of things, which are sort of simpler. But if you want, I mean, so there's a list. There's 15 or 20 of them that constituted 95% of the volume, which would be something to look at. I don't have the list memorized. Do you, you know what I'm talking about? Actually, I wasn't. I, I don't. OK, sorry. I should have. You should have been. No, I don't know. <laughs> Acknowledge. risk of, I may have just done a non sequitur of some type and uh, completely shut things down, or I don't, or is it, is that something that everybody, I mean, is that something that we can agree to, that that, you know, could be a deliverable from this, is that we actually just take examples and, and see if we can identify a way to uh, move them forward? A, uh, interesting conversation with Jacob Ryder uh, mm -hmm. when he was here. Were you standing here with me? Yes, I was. Yeah. So, you know, Jacob's admonition to us was come up with, you know, f five good things to do. Don't try to do 20 or 100 or 10,000. Let's just get five. You know, if there's five drugs or five conditions or five things which can focus the energy and actually allow us to do some demonstrations, he would be very happy. Maybe you'd be very happy. And we might be able to move forward. Yeah, and, and I would say, uh, you know, focus on the different applications of the genome. You know, one, you know, prenatal care, the other is pharmacogenomics. So you can look at uh, focus and, and risk assessment for prevention. The other is in pharmacogenomics, so uh, drug testing. The other is, uh, you know, could, could it, uh, how to assist a geneticist versus how to assist a primary care provider. Because each of those nuances, both the application but also the end user, is going to provide some different insight in how the genome and the genome information is used. And so if we do that, I think focusing on different uh, stakeholders and applications would be useful. So in the spirit of this conference being um, not what would we do to optimize genetic testing as currently done, you know, um, lo locus at a time, purpose-tested uh, stuff, but uh, that sort of leading the duck to the expectation, aiming uh, or skating to the puck or whatever your favorite <laughs> metaphor about leading, because one of, one of the implicit premises that make this interesting is the falling cost of whole exome and whole genome. And I think anchoring to it, the clinical aspects of that kind of use case seems much more appealing than, than trying to, to build out from the current, how would you optimize her to new or some, something that you're testing for in the, the kind of locus at a time model. Um, because most, most of the um, transformations of the, the, and the reusability of the value of the data really turn on our getting millions or hundreds of thousands or at least thousands of low-cost uh, observations that then can be used at some point in the future. I don't know if that makes, makes sense, but I think what it does say that the use cases shouldn't, they should sort of at least lead to this uh, low-cost genomic era. Liz? And I was just going to say we could take those use cases and then base them off of genome or exome-wide data for real patients that we currently have in the system who have, in many cases, a Mendelian genetic, but also an incidental and a pharmacogenomic aspect that may help their care. Well, th uh, this was a, um, along the same lines, that if you want to sort of take the whole genome, whole exome as a given, um, then it would seem to me you might want to pick the ACMG list of, you know, incidental findings because that's going to be sort of the agnostic stumbling block that somebody's, because they, they presumably ordered the whole genome, whole exome, not for one of those 
or, or maybe for one of them or, or something, but what happens if there's something in the other ones? What, what would you report to them uh, that would enable them to respond? I would argue against using that gene list. If we're going to do it, let's do it for the whole genome and see what rises to the top in terms of clinical actionability. It's an interesting debate. Uh, <laughs> I would second that. <laughs> Uh, yeah. I second that. I mean, I think that's a kind of a monotonic use, 56 examples of kind of the same thing that you use a genome for. And I, I like your example better of picking a heterogeneous set of examples that have very different clinical attributes like prenatal and carrier screening and, and maybe some one thing from that list, but doing very different pharmacogenetic, very different things with the genome as use cases that could be broadly generalized and expanded in the future. Still starting with WGS. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, so I, I'm sensing a potential opportunity here um, because uh, there are a number of funded projects now that are specifically looking at, um, you know, sequencing um, uh, and return of results. So there's the Caesar, there's the newborn sequencing uh, projects, um, Emerge three. Um, I'm sorry. Right, the eMERGE PGX and then uh, eMERGE 3, which will move more into sequencing. So there's a number of different projects that are, you know, moving uh, in this direction, but the sense I have, and, and certainly the people that are participating in them can disagree with me, is that um, there probably is still a, a fair amount of struggle in terms of, uh, or at least individuality in terms of the approaches. I know certainly with eMERGE PGX, that while we have, you know, 10 centers that are implementing, we're all kind of doing it our same way. And we're trying to aggregate data to say, you know, you know, what are the different ways, and Josh and I have been working on some of the outcomes related to that. But if uh, a group like this or a subset of a group like this were to say, okay, here, here's a standardized way to do it that could then be exported across this heterogeneous set of return of results then we may be able to learn something collectively across a number of different projects that could be um, uh, knowledge that could be uh, more broadly applicable. Um. Well, I, I can, there's enough strength in the room that wants to do the whole genome, and I certainly don't want to oppose progress. But if you just do that, there'll be nothing Ryder can use for five to seven years. And so I think if we, we ought to at least tackle some of the more prosaic problems so that we can actually be sure against, re because it's, kept, it's down in the database. I mean, it's not going to be up at interpretations if you're dealing with the whole genome, trying to figure out what's real and what's not real. N not that it's wrong, maybe we could propose both. I just worry that we won't get anything actionable in, in, in pra practice situations in the near term if we only do that. And what I heard from Dan, though, is, is, is that he's saying that we can use the, you know, existing, you know, data that's not been generated using whole exome or genome sequences, but think about it from the perspective of if we get this information out of, um, you know, uh, exome or genome sequences, you know, what could be different about that? Um, so we can, we can really kind of look to the future while still acting on, no, I, I, I think not, I heard you say I'm that. I'm not it's just the idea that at the level of what I think what I heard Ken say, and, and, and may, may, um, that at the level of these known genes, I mean, most people order tests, they're not surprised. They're looking for the mutations that are known to have effects. At that level, you could do decision support tomorrow with a little bit of dress, you know, settling on some of the issues. With the whole genome, the challenge is we don't know what they all mean. So the discovery of what they mean is this connection of deep databases and lots of details about the underlying, which the other problem doesn't mean. So I'm just trying to preserve that we could do both. Maybe I misunderstood. If you have the entire genome, it's as if you had run every test in genetest.org. <laughs> so you basically have the results available for everything that's ever been viewed uh, as clinically interesting, uh, and at least you have the stuff to do, you have the grist to do some testable hypothesis work <laughs> about the, the, the marginal value added by getting it all at once. Um, and, and certainly part of it would be pharmacogenetic, and that, some people would think that's immediately actionable, but you'd also have a lot of other things. Uh, that would be very interesting research to do. I, I, I agree. It's good. It'd be good research. I just fear that it'll 
people will be down in database algorithms rather than things that could be decision support at the, at the clinical level. I think I had Jim Simino next. You're, you're right, okay, and then um, JD? Just kind of following on what Clem said and what Don said, first off, in terms of what Clem said, we've already got people out there, there are already institutes out there that are doing pharmacogenomics with rules and decision support today using stuff that's a well-trodden path, et cetera. So that road is very well paved as long as the data is codified the right way and every client or EMR vendor can help the client upload that kind of content. Where all this genomic stuff makes the, the problem more challenging is the thought of taking, as Don, and you just said, the entire sequence and saying, okay, let's flow that into the EMR. But to back up for just a step and look at it from the standpoint of, we're about to face the challenge of, because I see it in at least my neck of the woods with my clients, I, know, I don't think we're any different than any other EHR vendor, to where you've got clients that are looking at getting whole, se whole genome sequencing platforms stood up for cost reductions in their molecular labs because they're tired of running multiple assays, multiple panels. And so they're getting these genomes, they want it simply because it's cheaper. But they're like, okay, great, one, I've got the ethical dilemmas to deal with what's with all this other stuff that I may have looked at, may not have, how do I handle that? And all the familial notifications and stuff, to where do I store it? And then three, how do I make all these meaningful attachment points, which brings us back to the whole knowledge index base of, okay, how do I measure it? How do I tell what it is? And then to get to Clem's point of how do I flow that through the natural path into an EHR? So that's the trajectory that we're on, which is good that we're all talking about that, though, but I think, circling back to what Atul was saying about how there's some stuff we're doing today that is working, that if we put a little bit more structure around it, we can take another step to the next level, as opposed to, I know we're looking, you know, five years, ten years down the road when everybody's doing whole genome sequencing, but some of that's about to start happening now. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the point is, is, is one that I was trying to make as well, is that there are people that are implementing, uh, you know, for the most part, pharmacogenomics, but again, the knowledge representation is all one-offs, mm -hmm. uh, and we've really not, you know, looked at that, for the most part, systematically. Yeah. Emerge is trying to do it a little bit, but we didn't get to the point of saying, you know, can we all agree to try and do it the same way? We're basically just trying to capture experience mm -hmm. and, then, and then see if that synthesis yields any, uh, any knowledge that can, that, that could, you know, go across. But, um, so, so I think there, even though as it is, you know, it is somewhat prosaic and it's being done, I think there's still some things that can be learned yeah. uh, from that that could move others forward more, mm -hmm. more quickly, particularly those that don't have the content experts that could ne necessarily manage the knowledge representation. And that is where I think the largest audience for this is, though, because if you go with the logic of the fact that there will be the number of locations in healthcare that will be in need of consuming this type of data will be many orders of magnitude larger than the number of places in healthcare that will be generating this data then you have a dilemma of where you know that type of expertise cannot be replicated at every level at every institution. And so you've got to build the bridge, you've got to build the system smart enough. As Blackford, I think, an inst uh, I think I'm trying to remember who it was, at Vandy was telling me how look at CDS not as replacing somebody's brain, but leveling the bar, leveling the stage where everybody works so they can focus on what's organically net new. Same kind of thing. You've got to get it to where it works out in the clinic, in the community environment, because that's where the lion's share of healthcare is going to be delivered. Uh, JD, I'm not sure who said it first. It might have been Dan. Um, you know, in a way, CDS should be considered as power tools for the mind. Yeah. You know, and, and only that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, um, I want to just really strongly endorse Dan's comment earlier of why we want to do it from a genome, and I think one of the very exciting opportunities we have here is to think about ways to generate clinically useful answers even though no one thought to ask the question, right? That's the power, potential power of genomics and why it is a bit disruptive to the current medical paradigm of using the clinical data to select a test to apply to the patient. You actually apply something that's getting close to all potential tests and then use the data to generate hypotheses or questions and answer those and provide them in practice, predictive, preventive medicine, whatever you want to call it, 
again, even though nobody thought to order the test for that reason in the first place. And I think piloting how that could look and how it might work within a healthcare system is the really exciting disruptive opportunity we have. So I want to just come back to something Atul said earlier, which is really getting to the outcomes part. So I do agree with, with Blackford with the notion, let's pick some smaller, you know, not the whole world, but let's pick some scenarios, and some have been mentioned. And I agree, the ACMG list, to me, isn't clinical scenarios necessarily. You need to pick those scenarios. But we all should, should think about what are the scenarios where we could build the end-to-end -end knowledge cycle so that we could actually figure out if it was useful to have used that information and that we pick scenarios where we can get all the way to that last question because at the end of the day there's tons of knowledge in our genomes but I bet there's a small number of use cases that are actually useful to use that information in terms of outcomes, economics and the things that will end up paying for the use of this knowledge. So just in, in picking those scenarios let's think about ways that we can get all the way to the outcome part of it. I think the um, the point to just that I've been hearing over and over again is um, what are we trying to achieve? The what should happen in ten years from now or seven years from now versus what should we be doing now? It does seem, at least from a standards perspective, it's always useful when people are already doing it, but doing it slightly differently, and you're just trying to make sure people who are doing it slightly differently are doing it the same way, and. I really like the idea of um, focusing on those areas because you know that there's actually people who found that that's something useful to actually implement in a clinical setting. Now you're just saying, how can we do it so the next time we want to do it, we don't have to redo the whole effort and potentially have a grant to redo the whole thing where it's, it's instead, oh, you thought our idea was cool? Well, here's the approach where you can do it using operational funds and just ask your IT team for eight hours of effort and you're done. Um, yeah, this isn't particularly different from what a couple of people just said, but I'll say it anyway. That, um, <laughs> uh, well, I was just struck by the comment that, um, you know, we already have a knowledge management system for pharmacogenomics. It already works, but it's a targeted test. Um, so, I mean, maybe it's really about um, the Les's example or Heidi's example. If I had done a whole genome WGS, not worrying about pharmacogenomics, I was looking for something else, how would we realize that should be fed to the pharmacogenomics expert system? And could we sort of recognize that situation and then recast the data so it actually would go into the existing pharmacogenomic system, as opposed to changing the knowledge system? Could, could we f recognize from the genome that we should feed existing knowledge systems and then talk to them. Okay, and Paul. Um, it sounds like you're beginning to define use cases that might be turned into pilot tests eventually. Um, given the relevance for lifetime and beyond, portability seems to be like it needs to be baked in. If it gets to the point of RFAs and that sort of thing, I'd wonder if there might it be advisable to insist in the RFAs themselves uh, multi-institutional pilot tests so that it's all standardized or and or you could insist on academic slash um, vended solution um, uh, working together in collaboration. One uh, feature of existing CDS is that there's logging of decisions and responses made to, especially in the alert model. That's an underutilized resource for outcomes research. So for example, you could do an outcomes project where you evaluate the outcomes of patients where the alerts were ignored versus those who weren't. As we look at the architectural considerations, I think clo that closed loop architecture needs to also include thoughts around what does the logging side. So, when a CDS supported decision is made, what are we logging? For example, if we log the strength of evidence scoring, regardless of what that is, then we can go back and you know, our assumption would be that there'd be better outcomes with the patients where there's a higher level of evidence. So we need, in terms of thinking through that closed loop dimension, that, that needs to be on the table as well. 
really quick on the concept of a pilot. Uh, coming up in December, Adam, when is it? December 8th uh, meeting for the Action Collaborative. We'll be presenting, Sandy and I, the seed, if you will, of a pilot around pharmacogenomics where we will itemize out minimum data elements. And we've already got interested parties between Cerner, Intermountain, Partners, uh, AREP is probably going to help out as well. So it's we've got the right people in place to, to start this as a pilot. So there may be something that can boil out of that as well down the road. Just a, a final comment on the, the genome. Um, I think it's important to realize that it's not fundamentally any more difficult to interpret based off of a genome than it is off of any other sort of molecular test, um, assuming coverage, etc. So I think if we could at least use some of the use cases and go off of the genome data, then it would be more like where we think we're all going to be in 10 years, where everybody has their genome and is carrying them around, et cetera. Going back to the issue of portability of genomic data, uh, because genomic data follows the patient through his or her lifetime uh, with potential utility for pharmacogenomics or other decision-making based on the variants whose uh, interpretation is not yet out there. Uh, the issue is how to achieve it. Now, one model would be, you know, one central repository owned by the patient. Uh, you know, patient registries and so on may, may mediate that. Another is really not, inter, uh, not portability in terms of, you know, different uh, EHRs accessing the same genomic data repository, but them being interoperable. And because this is a new area, actually it presents an opportunity because standards can be defined early enough so that all these EHRs have the same module, genomic module, that they talk to, and the data can actually move uh, from one module to the other, and also EHRs can talk to each other's genomics modules, so to speak. No, he, he, he can go first. So that brings to mind this uh, consumer genomics that we've already seen, and that a certain number of people will, out of their pocket, would just love to buy their sequence and have somebody do something useful with it. And we really don't have a mechanism for the admixture of uh, different input sources of data, which would have to be vetted and have certain quality measures. But uh, underestimating the, the, that uh, power source, so to speak, in 21st century genomics, that, that people may, may not want to wait for their doctor to order it, they'll just buy it because it's not that expensive. And, and having a pathway for the archival uh, retention and availability of that for clinical decision making seems like a pretty smart thing to do. Well, I'm going to make one last retort on this. Um, and I, I have trouble saying how I think this is a great idea, but I don't think it is, as this is titled, clinical decision support. There's a big research activity in it, which is great. I love research. That is, you've got the curse of dimensionality in this one. You know, you got a, what is it? How many base pairs? Four billion? Talk about a curse. I mean, I've ever heard that, you must, that expression. It creates lots of problems in interpreting stuff. And how are we going to actually do something for Anth this round if we only do that? Why don't we do describe both? Because it's not the same. You got all those other ones, we don't know what they mean yet. And plus, or we, or we argue about them. But then you can't interpret them, so you don't do anything. Well, yeah, it's so a different problem. That's all I'm saying. It's a different problem. Yeah. So I think that, you know, this actually, that, that is a, a perfect concept to move us into the synthesis portion, which is where we're at uh, at the present time. Uh, and so I'll turn it over to Josh and a tool to see what um, they've extracted from it. And uh, I actually have a couple of thoughts on that as well, and we'll see if we're concordant or not. All right. Um, well, th this was a really interesting discussion. Um, I'm actually going to summarize a little more about what I heard at the end, um, which is, I think, exciting that people are starting to think about deliverables. Um, so first uh, was the concept that given the existing funded efforts and uh, pilots around pharmacogenomics, uh, that should potentially be an example um, where the knowledge would be encoded in some of these existing and emerging standards and there might be an opportunity to achieve interoperability um, that would, has escaped, you know, earlier efforts. Um, the second potential deliverable was some, uh, a pilot that would 
first imagine and then potentially actually demonstrate how whole genome sequence data could be represented in the MR. Um, and, and perhaps the second part of that would be how to extract uh, specific variants out of it. How do you, what, what kind of value can, can you achieve clinically with that kind of information? Um, and as was pointed out, uh, the challenge there is the very high dimensionality of the data um, and the fact that we know at this point very little about most of it. Um, I'm going to pause there and see if the tool has other things to add. Yeah, so I'm just going to uh, riff on the beginning parts. We brought in a couple analogies of other fields. I mentioned radiology. Others brought in pathology, and I think I still think it's a useful exercise to compare to these other fields. Uh, we're not in this alone. Uh, there are these other fields that have done more or less and had have, have had uh, years or decades of head start, and, and maybe they're still far behind. Uh, we did talk a lot about uh, the um, software side of things, software, data model, schema. Uh, there's some, uh, even on a Twitter stream, who think we, we're ready to define standards here. There's others that think we're uh, not even sure exactly what we're calling these variants. Uh, and I think uh, in some ways, I agree, we talked about the real-world use cases, end-to-end -end solutions. Uh, but I also think there are funded projects already that are addressing some of these. Uh, ClinGen has some of these with uh, cystic fibrosis and others, but we could probably use more in the other alternative use cases. I'm not sure we really talked about governance much. Uh, we did mention a couple colleges, uh, obviously one college that's really interested, there will probably be others. But if we're in this mode of trying to adapt national standards into our local interpretations uh, compared to chemo order sets compared to all these other things we customize, I'm not sure there are enough experts at all of these sites to be able to even customize things, even if that was desired. I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah. So this was a really interesting session from a sociological perspective um, because um, it really, uh, I had exactly the same experience that Josh had, was I was really uh, struggling to kind of say what's going to come out of this. And within the last 10 minutes, there were three things that popped out that just seemed to be um, uh, obvious, and uh, a tool and Josh picked up on the three. And so I think at least if inner uh, observer uh, uh, compatibility is any sort of a measure. So the ones that I came up with was a study of implemented genetic genomic information to develop a standardized way to represent knowledge. We heard about the pilot opportunity with IOM. Uh, we have eMERGE PGX work that's being done. But I think the other interesting piece of this that uh, Dan mentioned towards the end that would also fit is that we have lots of sources of PGX data, uh, including 23andMe and other things uh, like that. So we could, in fact, potentially explore data source, um, provenance, and uh, portability uh, in that use case as well. Um, the second one is the uh, whole genome sequencing, whole exome sequencing use cases. Um, how do we feed information to CDS at the appropriate time across a hetero heterogeneous set of clinical questions? And we have several um, projects that are in the space already, the CSER, the newborn sequencing, and, and uh, eMERGE 3 to some degree. And so uh, perhaps developing some um, use cases uh, that could be distributed to those groups and say, hey, we'd like to see if we could test these across multiple different projects and see what works and what doesn't work uh, could be an interesting idea. And then the third thing was the point that Heidi mentioned, which is, and this is probably a little farther down the road, although we are trying to do a bit of this in eMERGE PGX, which is looking at the end-to-end -end outcomes, that, you know, going from knowledge to decision support to capturing what actually happens to the patient based on that. Um, that may be something more in the realm of exploratory, uh, how might we frame uh, a project to begin to look at that. I know one of the challenges, even with 11,000 genotype patients in eMERGE PGX, uh, that we thought, could we actually accumulate sufficient numbers to really be able to um, look at outcomes? But if every project that was in the sequencing space said, we're all going to look at CYP2C19 and SLC01B1, now, now maybe we have 50 to 100,000, and maybe we could actually start to, you know, generate some data about how to capture the outcomes and what do we actually see. So th those were the three um, that I gleaned as well. Jeff. I think that was a great summary, Mark. I just wanted, on this last point, I, I think we should also think about including the IGNITE network projects, which uh, have three PGX projects, two genetic risk testing projects, as well as a family history project, all 
using CDS and all measuring outcomes. Yeah, thank you for uh, reminding me uh, of that, and you're absolutely right. Uh, and, and shame on me for not uh, calling out the project that actually arose from the presence of the Genomic Medicine Working Group, which actually um, uh, is uh, convening this as well. Um, in the last couple of minutes before our, Liz. Super quick, uh, it's a small data set, but it's clinically generated whole genomes. There's the UDN that's going to generate some clinical genomes. The UDN. It'll be a specific use case. Yeah, I'll add that, and, and probably ClinSeq, too, for that matter, I would think. I mean, you guys have already been doing so. So in some sense, maybe what we're talking about is, is um, you know, and there probably is such an inventory of, of projects that are actually doing this, um, that, but just, uh, I'm sorry? Dan. You know, I guess it goes without saying that, that all of those, or most of those, you know, are happening under the aegis of NHGRI. So, so that would be a, an obvious way of aggregating, if that's the right word or the wrong word, all those data to, to, to the larger good. I guess everybody knew that, I had to say it. Thank you. Um, so any um, violent disagreements or uh, any um, uh, omissions, uh, errors of omission that we've uh, done uh, in this session, or does everybody think that we perhaps grasp the three? Um, Adam. Uh, this is neither of those, but just something that, uh, you know, I've, I've been trying to push with the Action Collaborative is to think flexibly about the system a bit so that we're, we're addressing what we need to today, but also able to accommodate what might come up tomorrow. And one thing that we've just started discussing on the roundtable is whether there's actually some type of component that could be added into the CDS for education for those that might be interested, not actually having it embedded, but maybe like a link that's in there so that someone could actually get that. Just something to consider while we're, can, we're thinking about pilots or use cases, how that might be integrated into the HR. Yeah, and thanks for bringing that up because uh, we had a little side discussion that, you know, we talk about clinical decision support as if it's a single entity, and the reality is is that there are different flavors of decision support. And what we're mostly been talking about is what some of us would call active clinical decision support, which is something that's operating in the EHR environment that's, you know, lurking under the system and is then identifying clinical contexts and, and will fire rules. But the reality is is that there is what some people call perhaps pejoratively passive clinical decision support, which is the, the hallway conversation, the, uh, the, the, the uh, tome on your desk, um, or something that is linked in through an info button or some other methodology to a clinical decision support rule to say, wait a second, I got this alert. Why did I get this alert? And how can we deliver that point of care just in time education? So um, we've been, we haven't been explicit about that, um, but I don't think that was meant for the purposes of exclusion, and so it's good to, to bring that up, Ken. Just to follow up on your point about info buttons, um, so info buttons is a way to get a little I button, for example, next to your problem list or lab results where you can get context relevant uh, educational materials. That's part of meaningful use standards now, and there's an open source implementation called Open Info Button that was funded initially by the VA. Uh, fairly widely used at this point, um, freely available, led by my colleague Guilherme Delfio at the University of Utah, and he's actually been using it for, for pharmacogenomics information that's available operationally in some locations. So um, I, I think that's a wonderful example where nobody clicks on it unless they want to, and if they do, they can find the right information related to genomics. Yeah, I think that's uh, great, and, and that is something that uh, Casey is leading. Um, uh, a study effort in eMERGE PGX on the use of uh, info buttons uh, in terms of the implementation there. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned uh, Guillerme. Um, it's interesting how implementation happens sometimes. I stumbled into Guillerme at Intermountain many, many years ago and talked about this idea of creating gene information sheets that could uh, be tagged into the uh, EHR and how we could link to resources like gene reviews and genetics home reference. And he says, well, I'm in charge of that. Why don't we just do it? It sounds really interesting. So we did. Uh, we stood it up. I don't think anybody knew about it, but we could watch the numbers go up and, um, and eventually got a, a presentation. So uh, it, it's, uh, again, it's dangerous sometimes when you uh, meet people and, and no one's paying attention to what any of us are doing. So uh, with that, um, I, we will, um, we're right on time, so thank you, everybody, uh, for the contributions. We will um, take uh, our full half hour.
uh, we'll reconvene at a quarter to four for our third session.